That's why we test it. See, you have faith. I I have the faith, but not 100%. I have the whole thing to make sure. Because I pay more of a price each day than you do. So, so I wonder if I can do it. should be the first slide of this. 
very distinguished panel. Uh, I hope they will be provocative. Uh, our outline for this session is as is, is follows. We'll give, each give a brief presentation of what we think might be the state of the world right now, what might be the potential solution. That might take uh, perhaps uh, 10 minutes apiece. Then each panelist will give our, spend 10 minutes giving arguments, pros and cons, as to why whatever they're proposing makes more sense than the alternatives. So we get, we lay some of the foundation of what, what might be wrong with some of the proposals. At that point, we should have about a half an hour left. We're going to open it up to the audience for, for questions. The way I believe it's supposed to work is there are two mics, and I don't even have to call on you. The two mics will rotate. Pe people in the audience are... Uh, Cleveland Fed staffers will identify people. When you get a mic, you get to speak. Otherwise, you can't speak. So, uh, uh, and when you do, please identify who you are and then um, address your question, hopefully, to one of the panelists. Uh, so let me, my, I want to just give a few brief uh, bits of facts about how the world looks right now. I'm part of an effort at FHFA to try to document uh, what happened over the past decade to put together data we didn't have and hopefully data that we will have going into the next crisis. So let me put up two slides, I think, that tell us a little bit about the state of the world. This first slide gives us quarterly originations uh, going back to 1998. And if you look at it, this is in first lien mortgages over $50,000. Uh, we're kind of back to where we were in 1998. We have a big spike in 2003 and four. Uh, but if you just showed this to somebody and you talked about a housing crisis, financial crisis, they would be hard, hard put to find out, well, what does that mean and when did that occur? Let me show you a second slide, which I think is, there we go. So this is data we've just, this is literally, I put this together last night, um, from our database. This shows the market share of new originations, by, again, it's done by quarter, and it puts loans into four groups. Uh, the bottom blue are the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie. The red above that is FHA and VA. And then this, the purple is the private market uh, uh, MBS. Um, and then the top are everything else. That's things that banks held on portfolio. And what's striking about this graph, if you look at this chart, is how similar the blue looks now to what it looked like in 19... 98, or certainly in 2001. It doesn't look that different. <clears throat> and so if you ask yourself again, uh, uh, we're in a crisis and something bad happened, and you look at this, this chart, what you see is that blue has disappeared, uh, and basically, the, but the blue grew at the expense of the red and the green, uh, red and the blue, the purple has disappeared, sorry. But otherwise, it looks pretty constant. Um, and even the top part, which is the portfolio loans and other loans, that's recovered a lot uh, from what it was uh, virtually disappeared in 2009. This is through the end of 2012. So if you look at this chart and you're talking about reform and the need to change things, in these first two charts, at the superficial level, it suggests, uh, well, what, what's the problem? Um, well, actually, let me keep that up. This. So let me make a few observations about the present, though, because I think there is a problem. I work for an agency which has um, had Freddie and Fannie in conservancy for five years. Conservancy is similar to a bankruptcy. There is no private company that goes into bankruptcy for five years. It's a very, very difficult way to operate. Uh, there's a tension um, in, between conservancy, where you really can't make long-run decisions. It's a difficult environment to hire people. Uh, to invest in capital that doesn't have a relatively, uh, there's a focus on short run um, uh, costs and expenses rather than long run. Innovation, it's difficult to innovate in that environment because you don't know where you're, you're going to end up. It's also difficult to regulate. The agency I work for has had an acting director for five years. Um, and it's hard for an acting director, they don't have the affirmation of having been appointed and confirmed to be able to take policy positions. So we're caretakers. And caretaking is not the right way, you could argue, to manage um, a big chunk, as you can see, the, the, the bottom blue of the national mortgage market. And 
arguably certainly is not a sustainable uh, path. It needs to change. But I think before we change, let me raise just a couple of questions. I think every proposal really has to, uh, has to meet. Um, the, the first question is, if you're going to change, you have to ask, well, what is it, what problem are you fixing? And if you look at Fannie and Freddie, um, they play a role uh, in the mortgage market in a number of different dimensions. Uh, they set underwriting standards, whether they admit it or not, um, by um, what loans they're willing to buy. That can feed back into the origination market and have a large impact on both the pricing of mortgages and on which loans are granted and which are not. They also portfolio loans. About 20% of their loans are held in portfolio, although most of those loans are loans or almost half are loans that they get back because they fail in some way in the, in the securities and they get pushed back to them. So they don't, didn't set out to hold them. They are a major securitizer, and right now, virtually 100% of the loans in the U.S. market, the purple has disappeared, are um, either issued by Jenny May, which securitizes Fannie and, or FHA and VA, which is the red, or Freddie and Fannie, which securitize the blue. So they play a major role in securitizing uh, and setting the standards for the, the securitized market. They also... Um, are managing and liquidating, if you wish, an existing stock. So they play a role in the flow, but they also manage the existing securities or existing portfolio. And that's a different skill. Um, these are very large numbers, and uh, you can't unwind. If you put the two together, 90%, 80, I think it's 82% of the uh, market, you can't decide entities that play that large a role simply are going to disappear. You have too much capital in too much human capital, the infrastructure to do it, cannot be immediately replaced. It's extremely difficult. It takes a long period of time. Uh, they have relationships with lenders in every market. They have employees in every large market in the country, relationships with the banks. If you look at a number of the things that they do in terms of monitoring uh, against risk, they've got, uh, human ex they've got experience in dealing with lenders. They can spot, f look at frauds. They have uh, very elaborate QC systems. Those things are not instantaneously replicated, and the models and the, and the thinking that has gone behind them can't immediately be generated by another institution. So when we think about solutions, we have to be very careful to be mindful of the timing of something that you cannot do instantly and you can't do without, um, uh, and there's a pace to do that. Um, Freddie and Fannie went through a large upheaval as a consequence of the crisis. They did what we're typically supposed to do when you have uh, institutions that did poorly. There were 120 VPs at, at Fannie, at Freddie, at the uh, time of the crisis. I think about five of them are still working for Freddie. So basically you eliminated almost all of the senior management. You wiped out the preferred stockholders, the common stockholders. Um, they've had a, a major change. So whatever Fannie and Freddie are right now, the cultures have changed, the people have changed, it's not the same institution. So we need to be very mindful of that. The deterrent effect of punishing those that, quote, did wrong is, is, is um, already taken place. A, a second element, I think, if we think about uh, what went wrong, we have to pay particular attention to which element went wrong and how it went wrong. Um, Bob Van Order has done an analysis of the, I'll get, use his thinking on, of the Fannie and Freddie. He argues that in the MBS market, they'll about break even. In their holdings of securities, they about break even. Um, in their, uh, he gives about $20 billion to man malfeasance, greed, foolish decisions. But basically, the rest of the $188 billion that they cost the taxpayers, he argues simply is they were an insurer, and their tsunami came along, and you're insuring prime mortgages, and you had house prices fall a huge 100-year flood, so to speak. And that's what happens. You lose money. Anybody else doing the same thing in the same circumstances would have also lost money. And as we can all see, most of that money will at some point be paid back. So we have to think when we are fixing a problem, what exactly is it that went wrong that we don't want to have happen the next time? And I think that's a critical element as we make judgments. Changing things to just change them isn't necessarily accomplish anything. Um, so with that, um, that's my, my remarks. With that backdrop, I'm now going to turn it over to the panelists.
They're each going to speak, as I, we said, um, for about 10 minutes, present slides, and hopefully present some perspective on a potential solution as to what the next step is. So we're we'll, going to start in the order we are here. Start with Shekhar. So let's see. Let's make sure. There we go. Thank you, Bob. I've always decided that it's better to be after lunch than after dinner. <laughs> so thank you for affording me that honor. I make two observations before I dive into slides. First of all, I am not an academician. I'm not a researcher. I don't know half of the stuff they're going to do in regression charts I'm not going to follow. <laughs> but I have been a practitioner. In fact, uh, I am a reformed mortgage banker. <laughs> we, it needed reformation, did it not? The, the second point is that I've actually, this is my second trip to Cleveland in two weeks um, because I'm on the Enterprise Board and they happen to have their board meeting last week. So my wife asked me, she said, you're not running for some office I don't know about, right? <laughs> um, and the answer is no. <clears throat> I actually came to listen to Sandra. <clears throat> so let me do three things in 10 minutes or so and then we'll go into the other conversation about what's possible and where these uh, entities, the whole issue of housing finance reform, which today it has more momentum for change than it has had in five years, <clears throat> for probably the most surprising reason, which is that they're actually making money. And now I'm going to explain to you why they're making money, because it's like shooting fish in a barrel. It'd be really hard for them not to make money. Uh, despite whatever they might have done and all the changes that have occurred. So look at the share of total. This is just one to four family, single family originations. As you obviously know, um, they grew rather dramatically between 06 and 07. Uh, unbelievable that it, they could have picked that time to grow that rapidly. But that's what they did, which is the bulk of the portfolio that has problems. So... One, they grew because they were a private entity with public purpose, and as you will hear in this debate many, many, many times, they had very severely conflicting goals. They had public sh shareholders or private shareholders in a public market setting. They had public goals with regard to affordability, but they also had the government backstop. So if they failed, their shareholders also failed, but we, the taxpayer, ended up carrying uh, the burden. So that quasi-status is what I think you're going to hear in a couple of minutes. Basically, everybody across the political spectrum will agree cannot continue. The fundamentals of their charter have to be changed. So there are 536 decision makers on this subject. There are 435 members of Congress, there are 100 members of the Senate, and there's the President of the United States. There's only one thing I think they totally agree on. This, as it exists, shall not continue. You cannot have a market where the United States government, we the taxpayer, are in effect supporting 86.1% of the total market, if you look at that top line figure for 2012. And in fact, Bob and I were just discussing the fact that we have different databases and they have slightly different results. Good news is all the trend lines are the same. Um, and that speaks, by the way, to something about the housing industry that's quite amazing. Pre-crisis, we actually knew very little if you had asked somebody in 2006, how many mortgages are outstanding in the United States? You could not have found out the answer. We still can debate that issue, but at least we know that it's somewhere between 44 million and 46 million now. We don't exactly know, but because there's a lot of private activity in the mortgage market that often isn't exactly recorded the same way. However, we're getting better at it. But the second piece that I want to mention to you about the reason for change, which may give you a slight inkling of my particular ideological beliefs in the sector, um, and I'll try to only hint at it and then get really biased once David speaks, um, is uh, because we do have different points of view, is look at the credit scores on average. Now, again, this chart is more merely to illustrate. You do have to dive into details to get, you know, something more specific. What happened to the average credit score for a borrower between 2006 and 2012? 
Well, we know that there is an issue about credit availability for the single family in the single family mortgage market. Well, here's the reason why. In 2000, in reaction to the crisis between seven and nine, average credit scores dramatically increased. So in seven, as an example, FHA's average credit score was actually higher than the GSEs. Now, uh, you would ask the question, this was the counter-cyclical entity that was going to, that does low down payment financing, first time home buyers, and actually is the backstop because it's 100% guaranteed by the government. Well, everybody was reacting the same way. Uh, fear has a particular psychosis and it drives everyone in the same direction. But you would argue, well, we reached the peak of fear sometime in 20, 2009. Um, how come it's actually either trended up or stayed the same? Well, it's because there was a massive amount of litigation and a huge number of problems in terms of servicer defaults. So as an example, Bank America paid roughly $4 billion for Countrywide. They've paid roughly $35 billion since then in legal settlements regarding Countrywide. So when you pay seven times more in legal problems connected to then the assets or the equity of an entity, something went really wrong. So moving on, the bottom line here is, can the government continue to be the mortgage provider for, what, 85 to 90 percent of the market? I think almost everybody would agree, unsustainable. That's not America. We talked about private capital markets. Where's the private capital in this market? A. B. Has it actually dramatically increased the availability of credit? And the answer is no, it has not. So we still have large swaths of the country which actually have less access to credit than they did before the crisis. So we really need to reform the system and we need private capital back in it in order to get the innovation that's necessary for single family financing to prosper. So let me take you to multifamily financing. How many of you know that the GSEs finance five plus multifamily units, some. Well, by the way, they are the dominant player in the multifamily finance market. The multifamily finance market's roughly about 100 billion a year. The single family market, if you looked at the average over there, is about a trillion and a half, so it's 1 15th the size. So it gets ignored, but it also serves the most vulnerable populations in America. It also has a higher uh, proportion of uh, housing that is affordable to those at 80% of median and below. So why do the GSEs do this? Because it's also housing. It was in their charter. Look what they've done. They were at roughly 28, 29% of the market in 2005, started growing in six, and in nine, when the private markets essentially fled all long-term financing and financing in many forms, peaked out between Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA at roughly 80% of the market. In 2012, they still represent 60% between the GSEs and 12% in FHA, almost 72% of the market. Also, heavy concentration. There are lots of other commercial lenders in this market, including banks, including insurance companies, and now the commercial mortgage-backed securities market. But you can still see this enormous dominance by government-guaranteed supported, if you will, debt. Let's look a little bit at what happened to the performance of these entities in, with, in, during the same time period. They have very low, look at the right axis for basis points, effectively, of delinquency rates. At the very peak, and there's usually a lag between a market changing and delinquency rates on the commercial sector. Because people don't stop paying their rent immediately. People don't stop making their mortgage payment immediately. It takes, there's a lag. So the lag occurred in 2010 when Fannie Mae's delinquency peaked at 70 basis points. Now, does that appear to be a lot? At the same time this was happening, the subprime delinquency rate was about 18. The single family, one to four, not all day, but conventional financing that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac did was about 4%. Bank multifamily loans were roughly delinquent at 7x this number, and the commercial mortgage market was at about 20x this number. So something different in multifamily than in single family in the performance of the government-sponsored enterprises. They obviously stayed more disciplined. They did not enter into new markets and new products. 
they do not finance new construction, they don't do substantial rehab, they do permanent financing. So by sticking to long-term fixed rate, and they have one other huge differentiator. In both products, since 20, 2009, both of them have at least 10 to 15% risk sharing by the private sector, either on a loan-by-loan -loan basis, on a security-by-security -security basis, for 27 years, Fannie Mae's had a program called Delegated Underwriter and Servicer, where the lender takes the risk of loss on every single loan that they originate. When we discuss Dodd-Frank, when we discuss risk retention, I would only point you to that program and its history of performance to tell you that it actually makes sense for the lender and the issuer to have skin in the game. It actually works. There is proof of it, over $300 billion of financing by these entities. Um, obviously, multifamily mortgage debt, again, the concentrations are growing. And I point to it to say change is necessary. Not, not that I, you know, as, as a practitioner in this business, this is good, but the status quo is not tenable. Um, currently, they have gone from essentially about 30, 20% of the market in gross between Fannie, Freddie, um, and FHA Jenny May to almost 44%. And it continues to grow as both the advantages of pricing, consistency, and the private market unable to compete, the amount of the mortgage market share continues to grow. So what's happening that would address this? I think Bob laid out sort of why it needed to be addressed. And I've tried to tell you that I agree that this current situation is untenable and must change. Uh, not just because there's simply no evidence. The, these were both Fortune 100 companies at the time of conservatorship five years ago, which, by the way, was September 8th. So September 15th was Lehman, roughly a week later. Um, not reminding us of things we don't want to remember. But what happened was there has never been a Fortune 100 company in the world that has ever existed in bankruptcy for this long. It simply is an untenable situation if you were working there, if you were regulating them, and the frictions that get caused. So the way the regulator uh, has responded is by looking at simply one mandate, which is we need to wind these things down. But you can only wind something down when something replaces it, assuming you still need capital, even if capital is constricted. So it is, again, the, the rationale behind why two bills have been introduced. One is called the PATH Act, and some would call it the path to somewhere. Some would say it's the path to nowhere. Again, I won't give you any bias. Um, and the Corker-Warner Act, which is introduced by Senators uh, Bob Corker of Tennessee and Mark Warner of Virginia. So let me quickly, in a couple of slides, walk you through this, because that frames then the debate that we're going to have to an extent. So they agree on the first four points. And then on the rest of the four, two pages, they agree on nothing. Um, so what do they agree on? They agree, uh, as I told you, there are 536 people that agree on this. These entities, as currently in existence, should have their charters repealed, and they should go out of business. And both of them basically agree that sort of within five years that should happen, that this wind down um, which would include, by the way, if you're looking at it from a monetary policy uh, wind-down standpoint, has to have some parallelism to it, uh, because the Fed's been one of the largest buyers of the mortgage-backed securities. This just has to happen for the good of America, for the cleanup of the federal balance sheet, and ultimately for private capital to enter. They agree on that. They also agree that anything that is done prior to this wind down effectively happening is co will continue to have effectively the guarantee of the federal government. So in other words, let's not get up in the morning and have the Japanese and the Chinese dumping their mortgage-backed securities because all of a sudden the next new loan that they make doesn't have the same implicit, explicit guarantee that it does today. So this, that is really just, I call it, cover your tail. It protects us because it says until such change happens, whatever is done by them continues to have the same uh, rights or guarantees as it does today. Uh, thereafter, they completely diverge. 
Basically, the regulator uh, is replaced. Um, the, oops, that went back, all right. Uh, the structure, they have a small agreement in the core that they will create a utility that will actually be governed by, in the case of the Path Act. The Path Act, by the way, was introduced by Representative Jeb Hen Serling of Texas. He's the chairman of the House Financial Services Committee. It has passed on a party line vote in the House Finance Services Committee. Corker One has been introduced in the Senate. Banking Committee has not yet had a hearing, but we expect something could happen with it by the end of the year. The fundamental difference and why it was so important that there are you know, five Republicans and five Democrats behind this bill on the Senate is that the Corker-Warner Act says that under certain circumstances, there is a federal backstop to the mortgage market. So the principal duty of the successor to the Federal Housing Finance Agency is to provide a backstop federal guarantee on the mortgage-backed securities that meet certain standards. That is an ideological fault line. Do you have a role for government? If so, how much? And if so, when? In the case of this, clearly on the House side, so far through one committee, the answer is there's no role for government in the business. We wind down what exists, and then the private markets will come in and take over and do the job. In the Corker Warner Act, that's not going to happen. When they wind down, it's replaced by something that then creates a new system. Um, how is this funded and how do we protect the taxpayer? Obviously, everybody is concerned about not repeating the crisis, not creating the same kind of two-headed institution that we had where there was public gain, uh, you know, private gain and public losses potential. So it creates a platform that allows for a system under which issuers and guarantors will stand in front of the government with a minimum of 10% capital. Bottom line, any proposal like this has the simple flaw that it will raise mortgage rates. So if I can assure you of one thing, any change from the current system will have two effects. If the, the least effect is it raises mortgage rates and it creates a new class, uh, it redistributes the risk in the mortgage system. That's the least effect. The most effect is that it reduces and constricts the flow of capital, which I believe is the answer, to give you my answer, if the PATH Act were to pass, it would actually reduce further the availability of capital in the mortgage finance business. I will stop there. It's always a pleasure to follow Shekhar, who um, tells us as it is, as an uh, expert in the market, and I think the fact that he's not an academic allows the clarity. Hopefully I'll be uh, somewhat clear as well, but leaving aside, I'm going to drop the regressions that I, were, I was going to talk about. I'm going to start by asking the question that we're here to ask, which is the new housing finance system, are we there yet? And in short, my answer is no. But what do we mean by are we there yet? Are we at a consensus solution which will lead to a new sustainable housing finance system? And unfortunately, I don't believe so. So let's go to the next slide and where we are today. Do I have the? Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as we heard from Bob Avery, we have a $10 trillion market, which of the stock is about 65% uh, backed by the federal government, and of the flow is about 85% backed by the federal government. There is an agreement that risk needs to be transferred to private markets. There's agreement that there are not 100% agreement, but there's an emerging consensus on reform that there should be a government backstop on mortgage-backed securities. And I think that that's going to be a consensus here as well. But the question is the form of the backstop on the mortgage-backed securities. What we mean by a backstop is for catastrophic risk. Therefore, private capital takes losses ahead of taxpayers. That, too, there's a consensus on. 
mortgage securities or entities would replace the current GSEs. They would be regulated not by FHFA, but by a new uh, uh, finance mortgage insurance corporation. All of this is embodied as we speak in Corker Warner. As we heard from Shekhar, Corker Warner is a bipartisan and it's the basis for many people, not only in the Senate, but in, also in the House, thinking about what the shape of new reform would look like. Uh, the, I'm not in politics, but the Henserling bill, I understand, is um, unlikely to be reported out of committee. Not, uh, it's not on the docket. Uh, there's a lot in it that perhaps will be incorporated eventually in a, a final solution uh, that emerges. But I will argue that even the Corker-Warner approach, which has bipartisan support, has major unresolved issues around three concerns, liquidity, pricing, and counter-cyclicality. Liquidity is absolutely critical to the performance of our housing finance system in the 30 years of very effective performance prior to the 2000. 2008 crisis. Where does that liquidity come from? The mortgage-backed securities market trades like no other market in the world except for the treasury markets. It trades over $250 billion daily. That compares to about $500 billion daily in the treasury market. The result of that liquidity, and of course the liquidity itself is highly tied to the credit uh, backstop of the federal government, the fact that implicitly, historically, and now explicitly, Fannie, Freddie, and, F and Ginnie Mae securities are guaranteed by the federal government. This implicit and explicit guarantee is part of the reason that we have this constancy over time of mortgage rates versus treasury tenure interest rates. Phenomenal constancy which is uh, interesting from an academic just to see it, of about 125, 150 basis points differential. But from a policymaker, from a practitioner point of view, what this delivers is basically affordable housing with a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Because it means that our middle income Americans, American families with workers, are able to borrow at a rate which is below AAA corporate. They're able to borrow at a rate that's only 100 somewhat more basis points over treasuries. And the reason they're able to do so is twofold. It's ultimately because there's a huge pool of liquidity. That huge pool of liquidity is because of the credit guarantee and also because of the lack of differential in the entities issuing securities. So there are three entities, Ginny, Fannie, Freddie. And within these entities, the securities are essentially is good for each other. That is, that means that there is what we call a TBA market. TBA market means a borrower, when they purchase a home, when they decide on the home they wish, they can lock in the rate so that three months later at closing, they know what that rate is. It also means that traders, investors, um, are not uh, concerned greatly about the difference in these different securities. They're not concerned about prepayment risk, for example. Uh, tremendously. They are concerned about it. They're very careful about it. However, if we move to many, many different securities, five, ten different, twenty different issuers, bond guarantors in the Corker Warner, uh, there is a chance that we will fragment this market from a prepayment risk perspective. But more important than that, even, is the question of credit risk and the implications of that in a counter-cyclical moment and the long-run implications. So let me turn to that, but before I get there, let me um, briefly review the uh, two approaches that are in Corker Warner. The first approach is an issuer-based um, uh, approach, and the second is a securities-based approach. I've taken this from uh, DeMarco's comments in May of 2013, uh, but I believe this pretty well uh, summarizes uh, the pages and pages in the Corker Warner. So the creditor approach, this would be the bank guarantor, would guarantee the value of the securities to investors backed by the shareholder's capital, shareholder's capital at risk, first law shareholder's capital, and then complemented in a case of a catastrophe uh, by the federal government, thus making the mortgage-backed securities uh, 
not at risk. They would be without credit risk. In the securities-based approach, the risk would be absorbed by capital markets rather than mortgage issuers. And DeMarco himself said that this would be similar to the old private label mortgage-backed securities market, but with the distinction that the securities themselves, of course, would be uh, guaranteed not the capital put up, but the securities, uh, the, the mortgage securities would be guaranteed. So why does this matter? Why are these differences matter? And what are these key flaws that I believe are still present even in the bipartisan Corker Warner bill? Well, first of all, I think we can learn from facts of history. And we can learn from the facts of history not only what failed, but what worked. So if we look at the left, uh, which shows the blue, is uh, the government support, government um, mortgage originations, and the red is the non-government originations, we see a diagram graph which is quite similar to the one that was showed by Bob Avery before. And if we look to the right, we see the failure rate of the different entities. The top line is the failure rate of the um, foreclosure rate per quarter of subprime, various forms of subprime, the top rate. The most, the top, the, the, the highest is arms, which is most subprime were arms. And that meant an annual failure rate of close to 30%. Whereas the fixed rate mortgage prime had a failure rate of an annual failure rate between 3 and 4%. So that's a tenfold difference. Second, notice how fast the failure rate occurred. And on the left, notice how, fail, how fast we had the implosion of the private label market. We went from one trillion to zero in a few months. So at a time of crisis, of a counter-cyclical moment, will we have the ability to turn to institutions which will be able to, in fact, rescue and continue having an ongoing platform, the ongoing plumbing the ongoing platform that Fannie and Freddie provided in conservatorship. Corker Warner, it may, it's obviously in flux, but right now it precludes that. Right now it precludes that and requires the existing entities to merge, to shut down. But the plumbing, the platform, I would argue, is absolutely critical to the fact that we didn't go into the Great Depression 2.0. So that's the counter-cyclicality argument. I think securities can't get you there. I think issuers can get you there, more bond guarantor issuers. But shutting them down in a crisis is, I think, a recipe. Requiring them to be shut down in a crisis, tying hands of regulators, I think, is an issue. The second issue that I am concerned about um, has also been referred to, and that is the issue of credit availability. And the point that was made by Shekhar, that credit has become far less available. Credit scores have gone up dramatically. And we see that actually in the uh, numbers of owner occupancy. Even in this time of historically low mortgage rates, the number of additional owner occupants since 2005 is zero. There is an additional... Six, to, uh, six million renter households, no additional owner occupants. And that's because it's become very, for a number of reasons. There's been a choice, there's been uh, to not become homeowners, there's lack of confidence, there is uh, foreclosure rates are high, of course, but it's also because it's difficult to get credit. Now, you also heard from Shekhar that it will be more difficult to get credit going forward. And my concern in a Corker Warner type solution is that the bond guarantors will have every incentive to price risk and to look for the best of the best in terms of the risk. What this means is actually for middle America, for all of America, this could break the pool. And the pool, the pooling of risk, gave us very solid, very stable, sustainable, not risky markets for decades and affordable markets as well. Thank you. David? Thank you. It's a, um, it's a pleasure um, to be here and to be on the panel uh, with with my fellow panelists. Um, 
So the basic contours, how do I move on? Okay. The basic um, contours of um, housing finance reform um, look something like um, private capital, uh, where private capital uh, takes first loss and the government reinsures uh, the mortgage-backed securities. Um, I say that that's the likely contour because there's consensus across lots of interest groups to do something like that. So the real estate industry likes that proposal. Um, the Wall Street likes that proposal. Uh, consumer groups like that proposal. Uh, and when you have kind of agreement across that set of, um, those sets of groups, it's likely that that is what the outcome is going to be. Um, it looks a lot like Fannie and Freddie at, uh, at the broad level, right, which basically Fannie and Freddie was private capital. Uh, it was undercapitalized for sure, and it had a government backstop which it didn't pay for. But the devil is clearly in the details of how you structure, um, how you structure that uh, system. But I think that there's a, a view, and I, th I think you've heard it a little bit um, uh, my, from my fellow panelists, that the government backstop is critical to keeping mortgage rates affordable uh, and preserving the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Um, I basically take issue with that view. I believe that a private market uh, and with lots of private capital can deliver affordable 30-year fixed rate mortgages in normal times. So in, in when, when the economy is, is, is doing fine, uh, that the, uh, the private market will deliver credit to households uh, that um, will be willing to fund an asset which is uh, great collateral, uh, and, and, and it's not a fundamental problem, but that the real value of government involvement in mortgage markets comes from regulation and standardization in normal times, i.e. regulating the market to uh, make sure that uh, borrowers aren't taken advantage of, that, um, and that credit is not too loose and standardization to ensure um, uh, you know, a more liquid market in normal times. Uh, but that its key role is also to facilitate the healthy flow of credit, of mortgage credit in a crisis. That is, when, when, markets are, when financial markets are functioning pretty well, they'll deliver capital, they'll deliver uh, mortgages to a broad swath of um, uh, of borrowers, uh, and when, but when you have a breakdown and a crisis in financial markets, that's when the government can play uh, an important role. And so what I've been advocating is the view that we ought to evaluate reform efforts, not so much in terms of whether or not they're going to lower mortgage rates by a 10 or 20 or 30 basis points in normal times, but rather whether they, those reform efforts lead to financial stability whether they're going to properly regulate uh, markets such that you don't see the kind of boom that we had uh, uh, in the 2000s, and that it supports mar mortgage markets in times of significant stress. So let me just say a couple of reasons why I don't think um, that the government will have a significant effect on mortgage rates and availability uh, in normal times. And by the way, when I say this, I'm talking about um, uh, mortgages for, um, I, I'm not talking about mortgages for low and moderate income uh, households, where I do think that there, there could be a role for an FHA type of um, government entity in normal times to make sure that there's really access for, um, for, for groups that, that, that would have difficulty with down payments and the like. Um, I think that there's a limited effect in normal times um, if the government charges, you know, an appropriate reinsurance fee, okay, that is a fee that covers uh, expected losses on mortgage-backed securities as well as a risk premium for bearing losses in a downturn. In other words, 
So there's a notion out there that one of the reasons that, the, that a government guarantee is valuable is because the government is better able to absorb risk. And it basically because the government can borrow at the treasury rate and the treasury rate is cheaper than what private capital can borrow. And I think that that argument is fundamentally flawed um, and that the government needs to charge not just for um, what its expected losses are, but it has to recognize that when the government takes losses on its guarantees of mortgages, it's going to be bearing losses at the same time that there's a major recession and downturn. That's a time when tax revenues are falling. That's a time when government expenditures are rising. And that's a time when fiscal expansion is important to, to, to help the economy uh, and, and to, help, um, uh, to help households. So you think about that $188 billion loss that was expected when Fannie and Freddie were put into conservatorship and bailed out. Um, that's $188 billion that could have gone elsewhere in the economy to support directly homeowners and other parts of, uh, of the economy. So I think it's important to recognize that this reinsurance doesn't come free and that the government needs to charge a risk premium, at least what the market would charge for those guarantees uh, in a crisis. So my view is that with properly priced reinsurance fees, the only real benefit of a government guarantee against this catastrophic loss or this, this reinsurance is that um, it does enhance the liquidity or could enhance the liquidity of mortgage-backed securities and that a more, a more liquid market results in lower yields required by mortgage-backed security investors and some of that benefit will be transferred to um, to, to lower mortgage rates. But I'd point out that that pass-through is incomplete at best. Um, that even if you reduce mortgage-backed security yields by 20 basis points, does not mean that mortgage rates go down by 20 basis points. That some of that benefit is captured by um, the originators of the loan. And I've done some research which, which strongly supports that and suggests that increased concentration in mortgage origination, the fact that we basically have now much bigger banks and much uh, mortgage origination uh, is more concentrated even at the local level, has reduced the pass-through of the lower yields on mortgage-backed securities into actual mortgage rates. Okay? So I think the effect of this, if the in reinsurance fees, if it's priced properly, are, are fairly modest. Another concern that people have is that um, unless you have a government guarantee, uh, fixed, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, which many people like and I understand why, will become less available in normal times and that we want to ensure that that 30-year fixed rate mortgage exists. Okay? And there's some notion that there are really you know, two types of buyers of these securities there are so-called rates buyers who are just buying for the, um, uh, the interest rate, and then there are credit buyers, that is, people that are willing to take on credit risk. And I think the evidence basically um, goes against the view that this is important. If you look at jumbo mortgage securitizations, which don't get the government guarantee, um, uh, that share is quite significant, and it's 30-year fixed rate mortgages. If you look at other countries, you see actually a, a pretty strong presence of fixed rate mortgages in other countries. I have a picture um, of that um, here, where you see the US is, is up there, it's on the right, but you see other countries also having um, a lot of um, fixed rate mortgages. And is there a way to go back? Yes. OK, so let me, let me just say, let me conclude by just outlining what I see of the, the role of the government in a crisis. That is, I see the important role of government is to facilitate new mortgage credit when the private market is in crisis, when the private market's under significant stress, by expanding a government guarantee on newly issued mortgage-backed securities. That is, the role of the government isn't to bail out financial institutions. The role of the government should be to try to guarantee, increase the guarantee of mortgages in um, a crisis. Okay? So what this argues for me, this, this sort of framework suggests that what you want to do is limit the scope of the government guarantees in normal times 
but ramp up guarantees uh, in a crisis. And I think that the proposals that are out there can be modified or can be dealt with to, um, to deliver this. In other words, Corker Warner, which envisions private 10% private capital standing ahead of any kind of government loss, you know, could make sense. Basically, the probability that the government loses any money with 10% private capital ahead of the government is quite low. Okay, and what that does is it gives the ability of the government to guarantee more mortgages in a crisis if that 10% so-called attachment point is then reduced to 5 or 0%. And as a government is taking first loss or government is taking significant risk in a crisis and it has the fiscal capacity to be able to do that because it's not taking losses on uh, mortgages that are originated in normal times, but it has now the capacity to then guarantee mortgages um, during the crisis. So my time's run out, and I guess we'll have a chance to talk more about this uh, in our discussion. Thank you, Shekhar, uh, Susan, and David. Um, the next phase, what I'd like each panelist to do is to spend about five minutes uh, critiquing their fellow panelists. Uh, those, um, those that have, I would encourage those that have argued that the, uh, there is a need for a government role, explain perhaps what the market failure is, what's wrong with a private solution, what is it about mortgage, the private market serving the mortgage market that creates a, a distortion or a flaw. And those that argue for a purely private solution, what's wrong with the government? How is the government playing a significant role uh, creating distortions in the mortgage market. For, so look at the alternative and present the case as to why that's a bad policy, what, what harm that does. So let me, let's start with Shekhar, go in the same order, about five minutes apiece. I, I don't even need five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> David's just wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, sorry, that was flip. Um, I, I approach this discussion from the simple perspective that this is the largest uh, vehicle for private household wealth formation in the United States. It is one of the main drivers of why we had a middle class. The housing crisis and what happened prior to it is one of the reasons that we have a declining middle class. That's an American value and therefore we have to support it. So what we need to do to support it is to provide access to mortgage financing across the country and we need affordable mortgage products that make sense in order to provide that access. We can't do products where we had option arms where, or subprime loans or things that basically could blow up in your face and people didn't understand. So we get that now. I think we all learned that lesson. But in addition to access, and I want access in Cleveland and I also want access in New York City. Uh, I don't want just access in, uh, you know, 14 major metro markets. Um, so affordability, what, what's the definition of affordability? Does, should everybody be a homeowner? We can get into the larger debate. Fact is, it means that those that, that you know, basically uh, have the income, have a support system that provides a down payment, can manage to get financing and find a home that's affordable to them, ought to have access to financing. So if you, if you sort of strip all the politics away and you agree on some very basic principles, I, then you get to the second point, which is, could you stand up an entity when there is a crisis? Could you have stood up Fannie Mae or the equivalent of Freddie Mac in the equivalent of 2008, October 1, and said, you are now in business and you will provide this access and affordability and this underpinning to the market? And the answer is, there's no way on earth you could have done that. It had to already be in existence, flawed or otherwise. And that's why we did not go to, as Susan said, depression, Great Depression number two. That's in also in my view why even though capital is still constricted, why I think the government role is way too big and needs to be shrunk, I think you have to have these entities in place, stood up, operational. What you ought to do is say, how do I make sure that they don't crowd out private capital because they have access to this thing? And I think you can do that a number of very intelligent ways by defining access, affordability, products that are safe, and also by, quite frankly, toggling the switch on how the government manages its catastrophic risk. Uh, 
So I think you stand up these entities, you create a system where there's clearly risk taken by the private sector, you ensure access and affordability with safe products, and you can have a system that actually works. I can even be shorter by simply saying I agree. <laughs> but I will take on one question, which is a fixed rate mortgage question across countries. It is true, this slide is correct, there are fixed rate mortgages across many countries. But these fixed rate mortgages are short term mortgages. They're not 10 year, 15 year, 30 year mortgages. Let's take um, Canada, for example, which is here as a country with a fixed rate mortgage share, which is large. They have a five year rollover. Uh, Australia or, or UK, they have uh, again a fixed rate mortgage, but it's only for a few years. Um, France, uh, it has a longer term, but it's a very small percentage of the market. Germany and Belgium are examples of countries with very, very substantial, uh, uh, Germany in particular, fixed rate mortgage. The fixed rate mortgage model of Germany uh, is, uh, has some real significant flaws, and I think we've gotten it, we've gotten it far better. They have a home ownership rate which is under 50%. Uh, so I think that I agree with Shekhar also about the concern of standing up an entity as complicated as uh, a Fannie or Freddie or a successor entity instantaneously. And uh, I think actually the threat of the fact that you're going to close that entity down uh, has, bad, uh, has bad incentives. The bad incentives are shown by what happened to the private label mortgage-backed securities as it became evident that things were going to blow, as it became evident that we were in a bubble. What happened, these entities started throwing everything on getting the short-term fees because they knew they had no long-run future. So you could have a similar kind of short-run behavior if there isn't a long run if for the entities, not for the shareholders. I agree they need to be wiped out, not even for the senior uh, leaders who obviously will have, if they replicate what Fannie and Freddie did, will have made major mistakes. But for the folks who are actually on an everyday basis making decisions, I think you actually have to keep these entities going to avoid in a cataclysmic event uh, a uh, being completely vulnerable and open to a destruction of the housing market and therefore the overall, the overall economy. I don't think we can tie hands in that way. So in this respect, I'm disagreeing on two bases with David. One, I think we've got to have entities that we, and maybe David, you're agreeing with this now because Corker Warner, I agree, it could be tweaked so that we went from a 10% attachment to a 0% attachment. That's not the way it is right now. David, you've got to have a good rebuttal here. So the good rebuttal is they don't understand what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> okay. Could be. So, so I, I think we're, we're closer than you think we are. Um, what, what I'm suggesting and what I'm proposing is that there actually is an entity. So there's sort of a couple ways to do this. I, I recognize that in a crisis, so again, I, my perspective is you want to think about making sure that credit is available in a crisis. Uh, and regulate it so that uh, in, in normal times so that you don't have, you know, excessive credit. Um, but you want to make sure it's available in a crisis. And I recognize that you can't go from nothing to, okay, the government is now uh, guaranteeing everything. And so I think there's two ways to get there. One, which I've proposed, is that you could have a uh, government entity, which I actually called the Federal Mortgage Insurance Corporation back in 2009 wow. for Corker and Warner. Um, which is a, be a government corporation that guarantees um, mortgages in normal times. But it has a small footprint. It has a small share of the market in normal times. And the idea is that the private market's providing most of the capital, uh, but that in a crisis that, that, that entity, that government corporation, would ramp up and guarantee a larger share of the market. And the nice feature of that, about this is that the government's not actually bearing losses during, uh, uh, not significant losses, during a crisis, and so that it has more fiscal capacity to more directly help homeowners rather than bailing out the financial system. The other approach is a version of Corker Warner, or a version of the um, kind of consensus approach, which is to say that, yes, you have private capital that um, guarantees mortgages with a reinsurance fee to the government, kind of like the Fannie and Freddie, but reinsurance fees go pay, get paid to the government but that you write the contract or the, the reinsurance arrangement such that in a crisis, 
really it's the private sector that's bearing all the loss. Okay? But what the government does in the crisis is then says, you know what? Instead of having 10% capital ahead of us in a crisis, we'll take the first loss or we'll take a significant share of the risk in a crisis to ensure the flow of credit. Because the government is then not having, will not have borne loss from guaranteeing mortgages in, it's going to guarantee mortgages in normal times, but the, but the private sector will have borne all the loss. Now the, the government's in a better position to do a lot of things to actually help homeowners do foreclosure, uh, help, help with uh, avoiding uh, foreclosures and facilitate modification. The kinds of things that we didn't do as effectively as we might have done the government during this, this current crisis. So I see this as a very progressive approach and really targeted at trying to help the homeowner. And yes, mortgages will be more expensive, 10, 20 basis points, maybe 30 basis points normal, in normal times. Okay? But I don't think the homeowner is going to be significantly worse off by that and the economy is going to be better off in a crisis. Oh, can I do a counterpoint? Uh, well, only if you allow him to counter your counterpoint. Uh, of course. I, <laughs> I, I don't, actually don't think he will disagree with this. Um, total banking system in the United States, uh, assets, roughly $8 trillion. Um, total mortgage market, roughly $10 trillion today. And it's shrunk, actually, from about 11 ish um, Is there enough capital in the system, you know, if you add all the mutual funds, if they ever wanted to do long-term fixed rate mortgages for the sake of discussion, uh, and arms, I mean, is there even enough money? If you simply said, let's lower the footprint of the government, I think the question I have is, to what? So I think we have to sort of get to the, <clears throat> unfortunately, how do you get to a place where you have what you're calling this accordion effect? How perfect can it be? So question one. Um, I'm not actually debating you know what I'm saying. I just ask you questions. <clears throat> and the second is, when I look at the example in the multifamily sector, what, what happened after the crisis was that capital did start flowing back. But if you were in a major metropolitan market, if you were in one of the basically the five gateway cities, if you had an asset that was, you know, a, a, C, a double A, you know, quality asset in the apartment sector, life insurance companies were standing at the door with money to hand you, 10-year fixed rate money. But if you were in, you know, I'm going to use Cleveland as again as my example, or in Austin, Texas, you know, uh, which is a nice growth market, you could not get financing from those same people. So how do you avoid pre-crisis creaming? Because creaming will happen pre and post-crisis in those two places when people have fear and when they're coming out of fear. And doesn't the government have to play a role across that whole spectrum? But I'm sorry, you were talking about in a crisis. The government Before the crisis, I agree with that. It ha it's needed, and post a crisis, it's needed. And I guess I'm just not sure that I know of, a, other than Bob, a dynamic regulator, or maybe Sandra can, who can play this out and go, today you're 20%, tomorrow you need to be at 40, and it's okay to be at 50. Sort of two responses. The first question is, is there enough private capital? I mean, mm -hmm. I think we've seen that the appetite for investors to take risk in the current environment is very strong. So the notion that, you know, I mean, I, you, know, you could securitize and people, investors would be willing to get more yield by taking first loss. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's very clear that the, there's enormous wealth that's looking for opportunities to take risk. It doesn't have to all be you know, in the banking sector, and the value of securitization is really to move it out outside the banking system and let uh, investors um, take uh, first loss. And I think the other point is that, like, we would be having more private securitization were it not for the fact that the, the Fannie and Freddie are, you know, guaranteeing everything and that the Federal Reserve is, you know, <laughs> big consumer of the, uh, of the product. And in fact, I think for the first time, we saw jumbo rates were actually uh, lower than uh, conforming rates. So I think there is capital uh, out there. I just, and I, and, and you know, my broader point is just that I think that government support needs to be targeted where it's needed most. And it's not to say that, yeah, I think on the margins, the government could be valuable in normal times and, and 
that's fine. It's just that you know, I think you just need to preserve, you know, in a time when we have uh, real fiscal restraints and real fiscal issues, that preserving it for when it's needed most is, I think, should be at least an important part of the debate about how we structure these so things. So if I may just quickly, I agree, actually, with David that the <laughs> private See? capital's there. But uh, private capital, I don't believe, would be there for the fixed rate mortgage. The jumbo mortgages that are out there are adjustable rate mortgages. The Starwood deal, as small as it was, is adjustable rate mortgages. So uh, the banks are offering jumbo rates, they're adjustable rate mortgages. I don't think banks anywhere in the world keep on their books. Now, the question is whether they can securitize, and that's where you're going, I think, a securitization from the banks. Banks, um, if we set up the rules, then maybe they would securitize. But then we're back to, in a moment of risk, huge withdrawal, number one. And you're saying, well, okay, let's have a small entity there. And I'm not disagreeing with that. That sounds very much like FHA, for a sense. Let's stand up FHA or stand up an entity like that. Well, maybe that would work. And we're not very far apart on the fact that you're agreeing that these entities, um, that, that, the, that the attachment point should shift. The question is, how quickly can you move to do that? Those are details. The other point that Shaker has, has brought up, besides this issue of ARM versus FRM, is um, why even, even leaving aside the question of catastrophe and leaving aside the pricing at the moment of catastrophe, wouldn't the equilibrium with the private sector capital driving the whole market, wouldn't the equilibrium be that there would be different risk-based prices for Cleveland versus, um, I don't know, Texas, for Idaho, where Senator Crapo is? I mean, wouldn't these rates be way different, even in a normal market? Well, I, I'm actually sure what we're arguing about, because are we just arguing? I mean, we're, I'm sort of saying it's, it's fine. You just, we're sort of arguing about what the, how much private capital should be ahead of the government? Is that No, is no, that I think why, why I've moved beyond, we moved back yeah. to a bigger, broader question, yeah. which is, so perhaps there is $10 trillion out there, uh, but will that $10 trillion be a pool? Will it be liquid? Will it be able to trade? Or will you have many different securities that are some of the high risk, some of them are low risk, and you'll lose the advantage of the pool, which will then itself make the pool a smaller pool? Why, why don't we open this up? So I think you, you probably agree too much. We need a little more. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, I, it seems to me you're really arguing about the role of government in normal times. That's really where there is a difference of view. So let's open it up to the audience. Uh, what we'd like you to do, there are two microphones. Raise your hand if you have a question. And when you speak, state your name and your affiliation, and then ask your question. And if you want to address a particular person, please do. So stand up when you when Sure. Uh, my name is Mike Simkovic. I'm a professor at Seton Hall Law School. I have a question that's uh, mainly for David Sharfstein, but the other panelists are welcome to chime in. Um, I've heard the sentiment expressed that if we put private capital ahead of the government, we're reducing the risk of loss to taxpayers, um, and maybe the government can act in a reinsurance capacity and price the risk appropriately. The question is, isn't there a big danger that that could backfire, that actually putting private capital ahead of the government will increase the risk compared to having the government take all the risk and all of the profits? And isn't there a very high danger that by moving the government back further away from origination, further away, and, and not even into purchasing whole loans and securitizing them, but all the way back to reinsurance, um, where you're operating at a much higher level, it's much more complicated, you have much less of a sense of what's actually going on on the ground, um, you're basically having the government try to do what AIG did or try to do what NBIA did or what AMBAC did. And those are companies that had really, really smart, really, really highly paid people working for them trying to figure out the risk. And you're going to ask people on a government salary to try to do that against the private sector. Uh, so. David? You know, if, 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 if I'm getting 10%, you know, if, if I, if I ha just have to absorb the first 10%, what I want to do is maximize the standard deviation. I want to lend to the riskiest people I can find at the highest price I can find so that the loss is very, the potential loss is very high and the potential upside is very high. I get 100% of the upside, I get 10% of the loss. Uh, 
So I think that's a great question to ask Shaker and Susan. Because, <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, they're um, in the in the plan in the plan, the Corker Warner plan, and a lot a lot of the other plans that um, various groups have uh, proposed. It's private capital with reinsurance, right? And so, as you suggest, there is this you know significant question about moral hazard, right? I mean, that was Fannie and Freddie, right? Which was there was some private capital, it was very small, with a government backstop, which led to this moral hazard issue. So in my original proposal, I actually envision, in normal times, the government guarantee being done by a government corporation, rather than mixing private capital with the government backstop, it was more like an FHA type of structure, um, although set, set up separately as a government corporation. I mean, if you look at the FHA, in the, in the boom times, it basically didn't um, chase the market and it lost share because it kept its pricing at a, at a proper level. And it was the market that um, really mispriced things. And it was Fannie and Freddie, which in 2006, 2007 got in because they were worried about losing market share. The government entity didn't, didn't really worry about it. So in our original proposal, we were worried about that moral hazard issue that you're talking about. Uh, and thought of it as a government corporation. I don't think that that is likely to get get there, and which is why, you know, I see that if you're going to be mixing government, another reason why is if you're mixing a government reinsurance with private capital, it's important to make sure that there is a very significant first loss private capital ahead of it. Whether in the end a policy can actually get there uh, is is hard to is. Is not clear, and some of the debate about the qualified residential mortgages suggests that we may not get to a very deep um, a loss absorption by the private market. But what do you guys think? So I agree. I think there's a real significant incentive alignment problem, and I think that it gets worse at, as you move towards a time of crisis where there's a race to the bottom, where all the losses will be clearly the government's, and all the, sh the fees in the short run by whoever is getting the short run fees will go to the, uh, the generators of the fees. And we're back exactly where we were in the race to the bottom in the private label securities. So I am very concerned about the way the Corker Warner bill is played out right now. And that's the, um, that, that is, I think, you've pointed to an alignment problem, incentive alignment problem that needs to be addressed. Um, well, let me say something because I think I can say this and get away with it. Um, the moral hazard's a good thing for a consumer but the notion of morality and Wall Street, they're oxymorons, okay? So I, I wouldn't worry too much about moral hazard on the street at this moment. I think the question is that will, they, will a system that's not properly architected with the 10%, and remember that they were capitalized at less than 100 basis points when a pre-conservatorship. Um, there is a great deal of work that has been done that says that if they had been capitalized at 5%, they would not have needed to go into conservatorship. So the idea of using 10% was to come up with something significantly greater than the 100-year flood and argue that it should be okay. I tend to, I agree, by the way, with both of you, that that doesn't solve it. That does not solve it unless you re-architect the system. Look at the system we had just for a moment in 2006 to originate loans. And this is obviously a sort of a classic bad case. So there must have been, you know, a few good cases too. But it was a broker who got paid to find a borrower who needed or did not need a loan, sell them on a particular product that made him or her the most money, convince them to accept that application and put up a small fee, send it to a person who was sitting in front of a desktop computer and ran three reports, very often without any documentation, who then sent it to somebody in New York or someplace else that also had never met the borrower, knew nothing about the loan, and just was looking at it as a unit that needed to fit into something that would also make the money and was running spreadsheets on how much the securitization would work. One person might have physically, might have physically met the ultimate consumer in this whole apparatus, none of the three of them were taking any risk whatsoever. And the securities were being sold with limited disclosure, limited information, and very often sold before they were even packaged and issued. 
That's uh, the architecture of the system, okay? Why did it fail? All right, now, let's re-architect the system. Let's put in place um, that you have to have documentation for a loan, that you need verifications, that you need a loan product that the consumer actually should have the likelihood of repaying on. Let's add to it some regulatory oversight so that there is actually not only this physical contact, but people in the chain are now taking some risk of loss, not just reputation, not settlements and lawsuits, but risk of loss when something goes bad. And that ultimately, in this architecture, there's someone sitting before the government called a guarantor, who if things go wrong on a large number of things that they've done, has the potential to completely get wiped out. That's the architecture of Corker Warner. I will not, I do not disagree with Susan. It's not yet fully architected. But get, in, get to work then, architect it right. It's not the 10% loss. It's not, it, 1% wouldn't have saved Fannie and Freddie. Five may not have because the system was so poor and have it ridden with fraud. Do you know that over 30% of the mortgages made in America, according to the Joe Smith, the guy who just oversees the settlement, had fraud? 30% of the mortgages made between 2006 and 7. I, I don't care what, how brilliant you were on risk sharing, the system would have failed. So we have to create a new system of architecture. Bottom line, I think it's possible and we shouldn't stop trying. Okay, next question here. State your name, affiliation, et cetera. Ed Pinto from American Enterprise Institute. So uh, my observation is a little bit higher uh, up in the, the scheme of things. Uh, I hear you describing a government guarantee system, catastrophic or not, and it reminds me, it sounds like a unicorn. Everybody can describe it, it doesn't actually exist. Nay, no politician's ever gonna propose anything where they say this uh, proposal is going to fail. They're always gonna say it's gonna succeed. And every guarantee program that the government has come up with uh, virtually everyone, I mean, you can talk about uh, the nuclear uh, terrorism insurance and things like that that are, you know, don't occur very frequently, but anything that's in the mainstream of financial risk um, has failed. And how is this going to be any different than that? Because the guarantee itself will create its own distortions, which will lead it to failure. So maybe one of you answers, Susan Schecker. Well, well there fail? were, maybe I'll turn this back to you, Ed. There were decades where Fannie Freddie appeared to uh, be part of a sustainable housing finance system. How was that achieved? It was achieved, uh, I mean, in Fannie's case, they started out with a lot of uh, capital. They actually had a capital requirement at one point. I think it was a, a 15 to 1 capital ratio when they didn't, weren't taking credit risk. And then that kept getting windowed down and windowed down over time. And then, as you know, the affordable housing goals were put in in 92. And that set them off on this loosening uh, binge that is to the earlier years than most of the charts that were up there. Um, but, I mean, it took a very long time. Uh, but politics eventually overtakes all of that and leads to the risks that you're trying to avoid. So, uh, again, whatever you do, the, the people point to the FDIC. That's the main example for the FMIC is the FDIC. Well, if you look at deposit insurance, either the prior federal home loan, uh, for the FISLIC or the FDIC, they both failed. They both had to be bailed out one way or the other. It's just the second one wasn't called a bailout. So if I may quickly respond, what I hear you saying was the loosening of credit over time and that that is endemic to a system where government is going to support. And I agree with you. I think that there are this tendency for uh, politics to push more loans out than are uh, economically uh, feasible. That's why I think there should be transparency, that there needs to be transparency and there needs to be some pricing of risk in the system. And that's why I actually think one new uh, uh, innovation in the market is an extremely good one that FHFA is doing and that's this stacker um, uh, uh, a bond which is attempting to price risk in a continuous way. That can be a canary in the mine indicating that risk is too high. Um, very quick uh, comment. Uh, and, uh, I don't think what is being talked about is by any means perfect or will guarantee that the United States government and the taxpayer will never take a loss. I, I just, I think, it, you know, fall we're fallible. Um, we will continue to be fallible. Uh, 
Um, I don't see a great alternative. And, and if somebody could, you know, sort of sketch out an alternative that had a high probability of success, that didn't blow up the system we had, I'd be there and here's, my, here's the bottom line. Do we think the private markets priced risk well in 2005, 6, 7? I mean, I, we, sh we can't get into this thing about the private markets are so perfect and the government is imperfect. I think both are quite imperfect. So if, if we don't have a perfect system, what we should do is architect a system that has the highest probability of success, ensure that risk is being taken at every level, and that we have a regulator with the capability to enforce those rules with the least amount of political intervention. So get rid of the housing goals. You can't have entities that are private that are also trying to serve this ephemeral purpose that can continue to be moved. You can't keep moving the goal lines. But you can have the requirement that you must provide access and affordability, and you can have a regulator that can ensure that. Okay, we have back there, is that the right next? I'm Tom LaMalfa. I'm an independent mortgage market analyst and have done so for the past uh, three plus decades. My question has to do with why all of you are so enamored by the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Uh, by my numbers, uh, it's very costly to mortgagors. It does them a disservice and it almost necessitates the government's role in providing it. Susan? What's, the, what's the great deal there? Susan, you... Well, I think in short, uh, for example, today we have mortgage rates which are uh, 4.5%. Uh, 4, uh, 4 uh, people are saying that it's going to be likely within a few years that um, rates could go up 200 basis, 300 basis points. Well, so if they go up to what normal perhaps rates are 7%, that's almost a doubling, at least it's a doubling from where they were in June. If that happened quickly, that would in and of itself cause a subprime problem. Because what it would mean in an adjustable rate mortgage world, uh, adjustable rate mortgage world, is that you'd have payment shock. You'd have today's mortgage, let's say as of June was 3.5, perhaps a year later it could happen. You'd have six, seven percent mortgage because when your mortgage came due a year later, it would adjust to market, you couldn't afford it. That would mean that housing prices would plummet. That would mean mortgage payments would be unaffordable. That would mean you would have a major foreclosure problem. And why haven't we seen this? Well, we actually did have a small example of this in the UK. But the main reason we haven't seen this is that since adjustable rates have, and we've had capital markets with international capital flows since, the since 1980, we've had interest rates going in one direction and only one direction, and that is down. So in a world where you have adjustable rate mortgages, where people are depending on what they have to pay out for their home, and that could double, this is a recipe for non-sustainable home ownership and a repeat of a major crisis that could bring the economy down. Next. Hi, Bob. I'm Walker Todd, uh, formerly employed by the Cleveland Fed years ago and uh, more recently an attorney in Chagrin Falls. Um, quick question on down payment requirements. Uh, we haven't talked about it that much, but as I recall, in the aftermath of uh, Dodd-Frank, the mandate that eventually came down to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was to start mandating a rule about what would be a qualified mortgage. And the original discussion had to do with some kind of minimum down payment like 20%, right? And that morphed over time into credit scores only and ignore the down payment requirement. Uh, I've seen some accounts describing the rule that's been sort of published for comment that uh, maybe you can get a qualified mortgage uh, with as little as 5% down payment if your credit score is high enough. But uh, doesn't, doesn't that risk repeating the worst aspects of the crisis? Isn't the benefit of a 20% or higher down payment requirement that sure it makes it tougher to get a mortgage but it's an automatic feedback mechanism if prices keep rising fewer people will be able to come up with the 20% and it sort of tends to correct itself. So maybe any of you, what's, is there, should there be a market for low down payment people and who should provide it if there is? <laughs> 
Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take it uh, because we've probably, this, this is called in um, parlance. It's a great question because it, it, it's like the third rail. Um, if you argue for a high down payment, you're essentially saying that financing is going to be limited because it's going to limit it by those that can save. And there are lots of statistics about how difficult it is for lower income households to save for that down payment. If you argue for a zero down payment or a low down payment, assuming the markets would go to zero um, at some point down a slope, um, then you're clearly asking for more credit risk. And if the government were backstopping it, it's the taxpayer. So there's some reasonable <laughs> solution here that has to, again, accommodate what I called in the architecture. And isn't that solution to uh, both, if you look at the facts, um, obviously you have consumer groups arguing that the, the loans have been made that had low down payments that performed very well, and loans that had very high down payments that did not perform well. And there's some statistical evidence uh, in both cases. So it's not quite clear where that fault line is. I'm not sure it's 20%. But I know it's more than zero, and it's less than 20. So, um, you know, so I would, you know, if, and you've got eight regulators, including uh, the one that Bob belongs to, that have to unanimously, and the one that Sandra belongs to, that have to unanimously agree on this. And it's just, it's an impossible task. So they're trying to end up with a compromise which will really be shitty at the end, in my view. All right, I think we have time maybe for one or two more questions. First question is, where will we be able to get so, your No, say slides? who you are. Say who you are. Where, oh, my, my name is Jack Reardon. I'm with the Ohio Conference of Community Development, 120 local governments that end up dealing with what's left over from this housing crisis. Okay. Now, uh, where will your, the slide presentations be available? <laughs> That's probably an easy question to answer. Well, they'll be available on the website. After. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, the first second question is, the biggest problem with this crisis was caused by the fact that there was no skin in the game for anybody. The housing prices were overvalued. The mortgages, therefore, were overvalued. Everybody profited from the origination by having these inflated values because their fees were based upon the value of the mortgages. Now, the question then comes, if you'd had the originating lenders have to maintain a part of the risk and not be able to dispose of everything the day after the closing, then you would have cut down on this. They would have been much more careful about protecting their 10% or their 20% of the risk if they knew that that was going to be, they, they could lose that. But at the way the system was working, it was no loss to them. They were unloading that the day after the closing. Well, Any of you, which would, uh, risk well, retention proof, would it proof solve? that risk retention works. The, there's $180 billion of loans made under the Fannie Mae DUS program by lenders who take the first loss risk on every loan they originate. No lender has ever failed to perform on their duties. If they started to have problems, they were merged or they found capital providers. And the loan performance of that book is approximately four times better than commercial banks and 20 times better than the commercial mortgage markets. So the answer is it does work. What you have is a very large market in the single family sector. For the sake of discussion, a trillion to two trillion a year, let's say. And if you turned around and said, everybody's gonna take 5% risk, simple arithmetic says there isn't enough risk capital in the system to be able to support that every year for the next five years. So you have to distribute that risk. So you have to take, in Corker Warner, they take 10% of the capital of the portfolio that's required, and they distribute that risk between various parties, including, by the way, the lender originator. Moreover, risk retention doesn't always work. Washington Mutual, Countrywide, they all had risk retention. They all, they own these mortgages. They were on their books. But the moral hazard of the crisis was they were going for the short-term fees. They had no long-term. They knew these, these mortgages would fail. They were going for the short-term fees. So as you go into a crisis, in a crisis, unfortunately, the risk retention rule is not a panacea. Now, by my watch, we're about at 2.30. Do you, we have another question? Or? One more question. It's got to be a good one and a quick one. <laughs> 
There's got to be another question there. Somebody has to have a question. Walker, you've got to have another question. <laughs> All right, then why don't we join me in, in giving a good hand for our panel.